Hey guys, welcome back to the Helmets and Hoops podcast. I have Sean Samuel here. I'm Matt Wilson. And today we have the exciting topic of our top three regression candidates for the 2020 fantasy football season. And I'm jumping right into it here. I have Ryan Tannehill. Okay, I'm so I, I realized that he was he didn't play all season long. It was like a top seven quarterback, top seven to eight quarterback. But as he went down that stretch and when he was like, oh, he's amazing, Tennessee was winning these games, he was very efficient. Um, I feel like there's no way in heck that he could repeat that at the age. He's going to be 32 years old. Um, They lost a couple pieces. I believe they lost two pieces of their offensive line. But they did draft Isaiah Wilson, so their offensive line. The last Jack uh, Conklin. Jack Conklin. Um, That's the one. Uh, he went, yeah. Yeah, look at me. Okay. <laughs> um, but he had, obviously, he had nine, he was over the nine-yard mark in yards per attempt last year, and that's never, ever been duplicated back-to-back seasons. No, Tom Brady didn't do it. Peyton Manning didn't do it. Nobody could do that. And he's he's way older than they were even in their prime and they've done it multiple times where they had like over nine yards per season, but it was always every two seasons. There's no way that's basically repeatable. And I mean, though I do think he has okay weapons. I just don't, it was basically for me a one hit wonder season. I'm not actually a fan of his weapons too much. I mean, AJ Brown, fine. But then after that, true. Eric Henry is okay, but that's not helping Tannehill's fantasy output. Too True. very yeah, much. Corey Davis, Adam Humphreys, AJ, yeah. Um, and jump, they have an unproven tight end now as well with Joey Smith. Yeah, um, I, and they for some reason don't pass the ball as much to Derrick Henry, even though he had insane games when they did. And I do know that they drafted Darrington Evans if they want to make a third down pass catching back. But I just don't think it's repeatable how he finished the season last year. Right, and he came out as the tenth. Per game, per the games he played, he yeah. was the tenth best quarterback. So I don't think that he'll be able to keep up that elite efficiency. And a lot of it was a slant route to AJ Brown, he, who takes sixty yards, yeah. sometimes multiple times a game. So I don't think that you can rely on the efficiency from both AJ Brown and Ryan Tannehill. And just a little yeah. preview: my regression candidate is AJ Brown. Yeah. So basically, the passing offense in general that, that was so efficient, I don't think it's going to be repeated. Yeah. So I wouldn't. And it's crazy. We were talking about this before we started airing is that AJ Brown is being drafted around the 16th uh, <laughs> wide receiver. What is, what is with people and AJ Brown? Everybody's so high on AJ. Yeah. He's going with. Calvin Rid- he's going around the same time as Calvin Ridley and DJ Moore, which I would have a thousand times before I would even think about AJ Brown. He's not even a name I would consider with those guys. Right. It's because it's, it's sexy. He's fun or something. <laughs> <laughs> the way he would, it's, he, everyone talks about he's like T.O., he's a tank, he's running people over, and he is, and that's fine, but I don't want him in the fourth round. You could have him. Let everybody else have him. Yeah. Right. So, but, I mean, he did show promise, but I just, like I said, the, everything, all the different pieces, Tannehill to A.J. Brown, I just don't think there's going to be as efficient as it was last year, and that's what made A.J. Brown A.J. Brown last year. Right. So He had a great second half of the year, don't get me wrong, but the yeah. way that he was doing it wasn't based off a ton of target. It wasn't based off of no, – I mean, yeah. it was based off of broken plays, which I don't like to look at. I like to look at opportunities, good offenses, which I think Tennessee kind of played out of their mind last year. Uh, as it went on yeah and part of football I guess real life football that plays into fantasy is these little nuances such as I guess you can make excuses that it's not going to happen all the time but a lot of AJ Brown's plays like you said with these short 10 yard catches and the DB would just fall down or something or he'd trip trying to chase him it's it was, there was a lot of weird things that made AJ Brown AJ Brown last year, like a lot of weird quirky DBs would fall down, or he, there would be a blown coverage. That's like, what are you doing? And he's yeah. open for fifty yard touchdown. So I just don't feel like that's going to happen this year. The reason why people like him so much, I feel like, is that all the plays that all the highlights that people the general masses fall in love with a player with are all the highlights. The, the the whoa, look at that play, and that's why he's moved up, and not and those 
plays don't happen all the time. That's why they're fun to watch. Yeah, no. So you can't rely on that to base you where you think he's going to do going forward. And I don't think he's going to do, going to do bad. But you have to look at their offense. It's a run first offense. It's going to flow through Derrick Henry. If they can, they are going to run the ball all the time. They drafted Derrick yeah. Henry to do the same thing that Derrick Henry is. If Derrick Henry gets hurt, they're they're got, got a guy Henry that's Henry, just yeah. the same thing. So it's very obvious. They're very deliberate with what they want to do. They want to win with running the ball and great defense. And their defense mm-hmm. is very good. So. Definitely. Underratedly There's good. no need for them to throw the ball all over the place. So AJ Brown and Ryan Tannehill, I think they're going to take a hit in efficiency. Um, so that doesn't. Yeah. I don't think that bodes well for where you have to draft him in order to get those. Yeah. Guys. Perfect. So our our first guys go hand in hand. I don't know why they're going to bring each other down. Basically, um, and my second guy is for aggression is Raheem Mostert. Um, Yes, the last, like, five or six games of the season last year, he went off. Like, he was one of the reasons why they were doing so well. Okay, that's, that sounds stupid, doing so well in the running game. But he he is in such a crowded backfield. There's literally four running backs who could touch the ball five or six times a game. Raheem Mostert, Tevin Coleman, who I think is kind of underrated. I don't know why everyone's jumping to conclusions with Raheem Mostert's going to get the ball 70% of the time. But there's Mostert, Coleman, Jeffrey Wilson. They've um, Shanahan just said last week is going to be a big part of the big part of the game plan. Um, Jarek McKinnon as well. They gave him a pretty big contract three years ago, and he hasn't been healthy at all the last two seasons. <laughs> But they're saying he – it's going to be Mostert and McKinnon with, like, Coleman sprinkled in and Wilson, which is weird because they signed Coleman as well to a big deal. So I don't get how you could set Coleman and McKinnon aside if they are healthy when Mostert just started to do well the last five or six games of last season. Um, and he gets none of the passing down work, which, like we said before, opportunity is king in fantasy, and those are just opportunities that are going to – he may get one or two targets a game, um, but it's all going to be to Coleman and McKinnon if they're healthy. Yeah, so. it's, it, I'm interested to see how um, McKinnon plays into their offense. Is, do, do, they just, do they just take out Brita, put in McKinnon? Because they pay McKinnon the most money. Tampa yeah. Coleman a close second. I don't know if they really care about that. but Maybe not, yeah. But, like – is McKinnon going to be the guy he was in Minnesota and he literally got eight or nine targets a game while he was healthy and playing in the game? Obviously, they don't pass the ball as much here as they did there, but I and feel lot, like, yeah. Well, a lot of what Mostert was able to do is he was able to do it when other players were injured. When Because McKinnon is yeah. – because Tevin Coleman missed a ton of games last year, then they fed – most are because they run the ball. They didn't have the committee of running backs that like they want. If they want to, they will have as many running backs as they can touch yeah. the ball during a game. Even just last year, they, over the entirety of the year, he didn't start any of the games technically. Mm-hmm. And he played in all. He had 137 uh, rushes. Most, most yeah. are. So that's – that's less than 10 a game if you think about it. Yeah. So there were some where he would get more based on he was people were injured and things like that. But if he's not even getting 10 touches, 10 rushes a game, he had 22 targets the ent- all of last year with in- injuries. <laughs> yeah. So he basically that's not <laughs> a part of the game. The yeah. Right. So you don't want to especially in a PPR league, you don't want to have the you want the running backs that have that passing game pa- prowess a little bit. That's why Saquon, Zeke became more popular, went yeah. more productive and things like that when he started to catch the ball. And Moster doesn't do that. Not at all, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, even Kyle Juszczyk, their fullback, they throw the ball two more. Um, he lines up a tight end as well, so that obviously helps him. <laughs> but, like, he ran the ball a couple times last year. Like, there is literally five running backs right now that they could use. Yeah, like interchangeable. So it's just, I mean, who knows? Maybe Mostert runs the ball 250 times. Just, they just feed him the ball. Um, but right now, I wouldn't bank on that at all. Yeah, I think they've put a lot into their running back room, and I wouldn't expect any one guy to be the yeah, guy the for anything. Yeah. So the only one that I would be tempted to take would be whichever one is later, Tevin Coleman or Jared McKinnon, because those are going to be the guys catching the ball. 
So it also depends on where you have to draft them. Because they are, it is a good offense. They will have opportunities to score often. So you do want that. But it's just the, t- the way they use the running backs is not ideal for fantasy, where we want all the touches and opportunities funneled to two yeah. or three players. Okay. Yeah. Who's your next guy? All right. So next up, we got Jarvis Landry. Cleveland Brown, I think he's going to regress a bit. He had a very good year. He was – people were, you know, de- deeming him the number one in that offense over Odell Beckham, which kind of makes sense because he had the year of rapport with Mayfield before Beckham got there. But I don't think that that's going to be sustainable. They, um, they've improved their offensive line with Jack Conklin. I think they've made a concentrated effort to solidify that because they were – they were blocking like Swiss cheese. It was holes everywhere. They have the problem with my main issue with Jarvis Landry is they have too much, too much wealth. They have Odell, they have Jarvis. They have, they, they just paid uh, Austin Hooper. They have Kareem Hunt who they brought back Nick Chubb and the offense that I think they're going to run. They brought over the offensive coordinator from the Vikings as their new head coach. So I think they're going to have a more run-centric offense. So I don't think that bodes well for the pass catchers, the Odells and things like that. Like, I, I don't expect more than maybe five targets a game for Jarvis, and his game is not deep down the field. So those targets are going to be 10, 50 yards. So he'll have four catches for 50, 60 yards, maybe a touchdown. But that's not something I want to rely on in fantasy. Part of me wants to disagree with you so bad just so the offense could be amazing for once. But if they replicate the same offense that they had with – that Stefanski had with Minnesota, I could actually see Jarvis and OBJ having amazing seasons together, like both of them. But You mean the same way that – As far as they use their receivers, like Diggs and Thielen. Okay. Um, But – I could see OBJ getting more work than people realize just because Stefanski came in and he said right off the bat, one of the biggest reasons that he he feels like the offense failed last year is because OBJ just wasn't simply getting enough work. Um, And part of that was Baker Mayfield just wasn't, he had a, he crapped the bed in like 90% of the games last year. He, He was playing really, really bad compared to his rookie year. So I think part of it's, Baker Mayfield needs to get better. But then again, I think just OBJ, they're going to pepper with targets maybe. I don't know. Like, it's I don't know what to think of Landry this year. I'm kind of afraid, but not at the same time. Um, and they do have the double tight end, the 12 personnel that they Stefanski runs out of like 73% of the time. So they're just going to have more weapons underneath for Mayfield to throw to. So it kind of does scare me. Well, even if you look back at the Vikings offense where Stefanski came from, mm. No, no receiver, no one had over 100 targets. Stephon Diggs was the high. I mean, mm-hmm. and Thielen missed five, uh, six games. So, but he even then he wasn't on pace. He had in the 10 games he played, really? he had 48 targets. He averaged 4.8, basically five targets a game. What? Who? Thielen. Really? Yes. I thought he was on pace for like an like 143 targets or something crazy. Where are you getting your stats from? Now I got to look at it again, but I'm pre- like, I'm not just kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm probably over exaggerating it, but I could have swore like one of them was crazy high. And I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. Stefan Diggs had 94 targets in 15 games. He averaged about a little over six targets okay. a game. Yeah. So obviously they're not a passing offense, but. So I think that they, yeah. it worked for the Vikings. They were a good offense. So I think that it's, mm-hmm. it's realistic to think that, the fans is going to bring that same mentality over to the Browns. So I'm not excited about the pass catchers because they had Kyle Rudolph in Minnesota. They have Austin Hooper here. Not yeah. the exact same type of player, but capable tight end. Two good wide receivers in Minnesota. They have two good receivers yeah, so, in Cleveland. So it's just but – like, But, like, all the – like, but the same offense was run for the last few seasons in Minnesota. And Thielen – and Diggs were both above average, to say the least, in those last three seasons, besides when they were hurt. So you don't think there could be a possibility to where both see – OBJ sees 110 targets and Landry sees like 90? No, I, I definitely think that they'll get there, but I don't know – because of the – not in the game plan? 
like they want they want to run the ball. I feel as though they really oh, want yeah. to run the ball and have Baker be more of a like a Kirk Cousins game manager that could they, make they a, probably will. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't. It's it just not. Um, yeah. I mean, you I would have imagine. Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt on the same team. They're gonna obviously. Yeah. Like I would probably prefer the third option on the Chiefs offense rather than the first or second on the Browns. Like those two guys are getting drafted. I feel like so. Who who would the third one be? Probably McCole Hardman, Sammy Watkins, whichever one you. Your yeah, favorite. whatever. They're interchangeable apparently, but. So if we're looking at those guys in as an example, so let's say Sammy Watkins on Fantasy Football Calculator, he's going in the eleventh round, the end of the eleventh. He's eleven eleven. So Miko Harmon is the end of the tenth round. So let's say round 10, 11, something like yeah. that. I know Jarvis and them are going to go much sooner. Jarvis is the seventh, and I'm sure Odell is probably like a yeah. fourth. It's third. So third. I would much rather get, pay the 10th or 11th round for one of those two guys than pay a third to fifth round pick for Jarvis and uh, Odell. Just because of the value alone. And I don't like the offense that they're in. I would much rather have a chance at getting – one of the, the – who I think might be the second in that Chiefs offense because of how many times they throw the ball. Mahomes, they're going to throw – he averages three to four touchdowns a game. If Baker gets more than one, that would be a good game for him because they're going to run the ball. Now, Nick Chubb, I think, is looking to feast, even with Kareem Hunt there. Oh, yeah. So – Like, Nick uh, – the Browns were, like, number 22 last year in rush attempts, and Nick Chubb still finished the number two overall, like, number two in rushing. So right. that's, that's, like, insane. So, obviously, they're going to be run-centric than they were, like, more run-centric than last year. But I just, as far as the football coach in me is thinking, you're running the ball that much. I still believe that OBJ, there's going to be some mismatches on in the passing game somewhere. And I think OBJ, but then again, this doesn't make sense for what I'm trying to say to you, because you're saying Landry is going down, and I believe that too. I guess I was – one of those two receivers I feel like is going to get – and have an okay season, like wide receiver two-ish season or higher than that maybe. But maybe yeah. it, it should – I mean, it, it should be OBJ, OBJ theoretically. Um, so right off the bat, Landry could go way down, like 50, 60 catches this year instead of his usual 80 to 80-plus. 80 right. So – I guess I, I guess I agree with you there. Yeah. I mean, and I'm checking it now. Yeah. Adam Thielen had 48 targets last Jesus. year in his 10 games. So That's insane, I'm not a, actually. And yeah, so my stats are right. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's mind boggling. So just thinking about that, even if they go up a little bit, because maybe the defense isn't as good as the Vikings. The Vikings defense wasn't good actually last year. Yeah. So. I just don't see an opportunity for them to have as good of a season as they – well, Odell didn't have a very good season last year. So I'm not excited about any of the pass catchers for Cleveland. I think they'll still be a good team, and it won't matter. But if we're talking about someone I want on my fantasy team, I don't want that. I'd much rather take the A.J. Browns or the guys that have a the Brandon Iukes in round 9, 10 – I talked about the Chiefs guys. I'd rather have those guys that are a bit of an unknown because I think I know what I'm going to get. I'm not – I don't think it's going to be useful with Jarvis and Odell. Okay, checks out. <laughs> Fine. All right, now I'm going to my next guy here, which may be my biggest, whoa, holy crap, regression, depending on what you believe. But I think <laughs> Kenyon Drake isn't going to have – anywhere near the type of season he was going to have, he's going to have that he had last season when he actually got to Arizona. There were so many weird flukes going on that it's insane. Like he had that production with before he got on the team, their offensive line was so bad, like high school football level offensive line. When he got on the team, this is a very interesting step. Their run blocking was up to number four. They were they were ranked over 90 when he got on the team, which is kind of weird. I don't even know how to equate how that happened, but maybe it's just going off of his actual production. And 
he only had a 4% breakaway rate, which is, I believe, in the high 30s, which means he would he would basically just run the ball, and the second he got hit, he would just go down, which I thought he was watching him in the game. He was a little better than that. Like, he's very very quick guy. But, like, what, I can't – figure out why all of a sudden their offensive line, maybe it's a morale thing. Like the first couple games he was there, he was literally amazing. I think he scored two or three touchdowns, rushing touchdowns the first game he was there. Like just gave everybody a morale boost, but I don't get how their offensive line had such, had such a big jump to where he got on the team. And I just feel like they're all, because they didn't add anybody besides um, Josh Jones, which is really good from Houston, who fell to them all the way in the third, late third round. You're talking about skill positions? Like they haven't added anyone to the backfield? Uh, no, I meant like to the offensive line. I was just saying, like, I don't get how oh, right, all right, right. of a sudden they their offensive line played like a top five offensive line in terms of run blocking efficiency. Right. But I don't know. Like it's <laughs> – You just he was like unusually it? efficient behind their offensive line. So the <sighs> – I don't know, the, once again, the coach in me is like, how does that physically happen? So I don't know if it was, like I said, it was the morale boost. I know I'm just babbling about stupid crap right now, but it's just mind boggling how they went from one of the worst to a single player getting on the team and they're blocking like Indianapolis' offensive line or like Dallas's offensive line. It's just really weird to me. So I don't know if they'll replicate it with the offensive line, if they could sustain how well they blocked last season. But and they added so many more weapons. I, I don't think the game script is going to be on Arizona's Kenyon Drake side this year. I think they're going to be up. And I think they're going to win more games. They'll be up in more games now with DeAndre Hopkins, Kyler Murray getting that second-year rapport. But then again, he hasn't been working with anybody since COVID. But um, but even then, if you're talking about game script, he's game script, game script proof because they threw him the ball. When he came over – he came over week seven. He had these are his targets for at least his first five games: four, seven, seven, five, three. And in those same games, he had the rusher attempt for 15, 10, 16, 13, 11. So he's getting 15 to 20 opportunities per game in both the, on the ground and in the air. So I think that Kenyon Drake is Thank game screw proof. They run so many plays in Arizona that they're going to either probably be up big or down big and they're going to play the same way they play fast there are a lot of plays going so uh even though they spread the ball around I think it was very obvious that they didn't use multiple running backs they used Kenyon Drake and they really haven't added to that backfield that's it's funny you brought that up with the whole they had they didn't use any other running backs and I'm checking right now to see if I'm even right on this which I'm probably not <laughs> just I'm trying to go against what you're saying um I believe week eight on, the, Chase Edmonds was hurt. But let me see here. And that was the guy who, the game before that, ran the ball for almost 30 times for 126 yards. Right. And so I don't know, but let me check real quick to make sure I'm right. Because I know. You're checking to see his uh, when he was injured? Yeah. I'm just, I don't know why I got, I'm in the. I'm looking at injuries right now. It's just not showing me. It's just showing that he didn't run the ball after week eight. So maybe <laughs> – I don't know, but I could have swear he got injured. I mean, that um, would make so sense if he did. Because yeah. normally – even the And now they added Eno Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah, oh, for, right. What were we going to say? Yeah, I mean, even when you – even if you're not the starting running back, typically you get two, three, clean up, you know, let the guy rest, give him a, give him a blow or whatever. Whatever they call it when you – I don't even know. I don't get that turn of phrase, but uh, we all like a blow. Yeah. <laughs> hey <laughs> So, um, but no, that sounds about right. That Chase Edmonds, he had that one good game and then he kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because I think that they try to use Kenyon Drake and I'm looking at it here that Chase Edmonds did not – he he does have games. He was either deactivated or not playing in weeks okay. 9, no. 10, 11. And at that point, maybe they just felt Kenny Drake had taken the job over and they're like, Why? Yeah, like they weren't, they weren't going to stop a good thing basically, yeah. Right. So I think that it's obvious what they want to do. They added Eno Benjamin, but he was a fourth or fifth round pick, so that's not really much of an investment. 
Mm-mm. Yeah. Or was it later? I don't know. But... Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Eno was a seventh round pick. Oh. Yeah. But, but which is really weird because Chase Edmonds, when he did play last year, like he had games where he had eight attempts for 60 yards. He always averaged like five, six yards or higher when he ran the ball. But now in – I know you obviously can't agree with all these reports and everything like that, but they're saying Eno Benjamin was brought in to take over for Chase Edmonds. So I don't know if for some reason Kingsbury loves Eno just simply because he <laughs> was an elite pass catcher at Arizona State. So I don't know. But obviously I don't think if Drake is healthy, he's not gonna Eno's not gonna come in and take actual legitimate carries away or anything like that. But I don't know. To me, it's just the whole run, the, the offensive line, and why they went from horrible to just mauling people. So I don't know. So this this whole argument of mine could be off, and he's going to still be like a top 10 running back or something like that, or their offensive line goes back to what they've been the last three seasons. So I don't know. Yeah. So it's really just, and you're right, he was a seventh round pick. So I gave – they they basically invested nothing. That's a dart throw. That's just another body in the room. Yeah. So I'm a like little bit – Sorry. Go on. No. <laughs> I'm just a little shocked that you think that Ken, Kenyon Drake won't have a great season. So when do you start to consider him in fantasy football drafts? Jesus, man. I really – I don't want to take him in the top, like, 10 to 12. Top but 10 I really back should. Like top 10 overall pick. Top ten to twelve running backs, but I guess it's just—I guess it's just dumb to say. But I don't know. For some reason, it just scares me. That offensive line scares me. I don't know what it is about it. <laughs> but like, does DeAndre Hopkins coming in take away the targets that they forced? They had to basically force Drake some games. I don't know. Well, I don't know if they necessarily had to force it to him. If as opposed to like just incorporating him in the game plan. Game currently, plan. currently, Kenyon Drake is on Fantasy Football Calculator. His average draft position is the 112. So basically the end of the first Dang, round. Yeah. The ninth running back taken off the that, board. Yeah. So if I mean would you prefer him and the other guys that are going around him, Joe Mixon, Josh Jacobs, Nick Chubb? I wouldn't touch Drake over like Jacobs or Chubb. Mixon? Why the heck? That's another guy to me like AJ Brown. Why in God's name is Joe Mixon looked at any different this year than he has last year, like or any other year. Six, seven games or whatever it was of the season, he was on fire. He did. He did go. He did. He was on fire. I traded like I dropped him. Cole Beasley for him in like week, whatever, right before the trade deadline. But um, he did do pretty well because they were just feeding him the ball because they realized how good of a natural running back Joe Mixon is. But I'm just still afraid of the offensive line. They added. Two players the offensive line, one's only going to start. So I don't know. I just feel like they messed up their offseason. But I don't know. But I, Jacobs and Chubb I'd have more. I think that it's going to – well, we're switching it up. But anyways, talking about Mixon, I think that their offense yeah. could be extremely good. I mean, they need help on the offensive line, but they got a new quarterback. They have Tyler yeah. Boyd coming back. A.J. Green should be right. Hopefully, T. Higgins on the outside, right. AJ and T. Higgins on the outside. They have a really good receiving core there. And right. who knows? What if Joe Burrow actually does go off like he did at LSU and he's just slinging three or four touchdowns a game? I don't even think he needs to be. Actually, no, not even that. I don't know what I'm saying. Even if he hits two or three, as long as he's efficient, the weapons they have should right. run you the mean- offense itself. He just needs to not be a scrub, and he'd be fine. I mean, I think Jonah Williams played really well, their left tackle. Um, that's kind of only one they have. Bobby Hart is – I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is the first year they're seeing Jonah Williams, too. He was hurt all last year, which is yeah. a big addition. So, I think that it's going to be interesting because I think they could be a middle to – not a not a great team, not the first year, but I think that you could see a real improvement – just one year after having the first overall pick. Checks out. So I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. But do we still have one more regression candidate for you? <laughs> yeah, we still have one more. Um, I think, yeah. So when we're talking about regression, we're talking about players that we think are going to not do as well as they did last year based on their end-of-the-year finish. So – I think it's interesting depending on what you – like taking a, a, 
step to the side of basically what we're trying to do here is I think that we're trying to find, identify players that are going to be helpful on a game to game basis, because a lot of these guys just accumulated stats or it's not helpful if someone gets you 30 points in one game and then the next two games, they get you zeros where their average looks good. But you know, if you look at the whole season and every week, they weren't helping your team. They helped you once and then they killed you the other times. It might've caused you to lose your week. So was there any criteria that you used to make these like selections where you're just looking at kind of where they finish and how it made you like the feelings you had during the season, if you own these guys, you know, the, oh, the vibes. Yeah. So like you said, opportunity is key. A lot of the, I mean, a lot of the times if they're not as good of a player or like say you take Joe Mixon over somebody like Nick Chubb, I don't know if he's, that's a good comparison, but like, let's say Joe Mixon is rushing the ball 25 times a game and gets five targets. I'd rather take him over Nick Chubb who rushes 18 times a game and five targets. So basically, and I also look for consistency. That's something that I didn't look into as much as I should have. But like you said, uh, like Tyreek Hill, if for some reason Mahomes was either having an off week or he for some random reason would target Demarcus Robinson or Michael Hartman, yeah, Tyreek Hill would have two straight games where it's like 18 points, 28, 29 points. But if they have two or three games in between, it's like six to ten. That could mess you up pretty bad. So I look – I try my best. If they're not a top ten receiver or something, basically, I'll look for the guy who averages 11 or 12 yards a game rather than somebody who goes 25, 19, and then seven. It's just – I need consistency, <laughs> Yeah. Right. So that's how I typically draft as well. I like to draft guys that have a good baseline um, because based yeah. on opportunity touches and things like that, I know where the offense is going to funnel through them or they'll be one or two or one of the two or three players that are valuable on that offense. So I like to start out there and then I need to look at their ceiling after that. So I care about a good floor and I'm not going for those guys that like to me, I'm don't really and I've talked about this earlier in the episode like the Cleveland Browns guys where I think they have a, a fine floor but I don't think they have a ceiling like their ceiling is not or their ceiling is very know. low yeah right so I want the guys that have I know at least like a Calvin Ridley like he has a good floor in my opinion but he could he could go off at any time like he is not a stranger to scoring two touchdowns 150 yeah. yards a game it won't be every week and that's fine but where you get these guys I want to you can't – if you go for these high floor, low ceiling guys, you're not going to lose your league. You're not going to come in last, but you're not going to come in first. You need those explosions yeah. for you to go over the top. Everyone can't be all vanilla every single week for you. So, but anyways, just yeah. taking a little sidestep for talking about how we went about making the selections for our regression candidates. My last one is Devontae Parker. So Devontae Parker was super sexy last year. It was fun to watch him play. You saw him beast mode the last half of the year. Um, Fitzpatrick was throwing the ball up. Devontae didn't care who was under him. Someone's baby, he didn't care. He spanked him. It was nasty. He had 128 targets last year, only 72 catches, but he still managed to reach yeah. 1,200 yards and nine receiving touchdowns. Now, I think that he, although the targets can be replicable, I think that the Miami offense is going to be better. Their team's going to be better. Not absolutely hopeless. So, and it'll be interesting because they also have the, the, the added factor of Tua potentially taking over some point in the season. And I don't know how that would affect, but there's a lot of variability where I think they won't have to throw the ball because they were down two scores a lot of the time, just because they were a bad team, they would have to throw it. And Fitzpatrick is known to funnel the ball too. His receivers. That's why Brandon yeah. Marshall, uh, back in uh, when he was playing on the New York Jets, Brandon Marshall and white receiver. What was his name? Stokely. Not Brandon Wait, Stokely. Who? It was who was the the Eric Decker? Jesus, Eric Decker oh, and duh. I was like, what? I was the like, I had it. Yeah. Um, Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker feasted on the New York Jets team with Fitzpatrick at the helm, and the reason why is because he only goes to those two guys. If you looked at their stats for the rest of the – if you looked at the stats for the other players, they would hardly have over three three targets that in any game. 
you know where the ball is going when Fitzpatrick's at the helm. So I think that it's going to be very good for Devontae Parker for the first half of the season or until Tua takes over. And then who knows what's going to happen. And I don't want that. If anything, I want to get stronger at the second half of the year. So I would take the hit if I thought that a player was going – like a rookie is going to take a few weeks to get his feet under him and then start to produce later on in the year. That's where I want to make my push as opposed to starting out in the hole because when you start out in the hole, you get desperate. You don't know what's going – you don't know what you're going to do. Trades, you get taken advantage of in trades. You're viewed in a certain way. So maybe you don't care about the view, but that's why I'm not really drawn to Devontae Parker personally. And I think that he's going to regress and you won't be able to see it um, right away, but it will be there. So Yeah, like the Miami's D, yeah, defense in general is a lot better. They have, I think they have one of the best cornerback tandems in the, the entire NFL and Xavier Howard and Byron Jones. At the time, they made Xavier Howard, I believe he was the number one paid corner, and now they just gave an insane amount to Byron Jones. Um, and they brought in a lot of those Patriot guys as well. So Brian Flores is trying to recreate the Patriots' defense. He came out right off the bat and said that. So, And if the offensive line plays as well as they actually do and they can, they don't need to pass the ball 42 times a game like they did last year, the opportunities in general just may not be there as much for Devontae Parker. Because last year they were just throwing the ball downfield left and right with Fitzpatrick because they didn't have they didn't have the game script to run the ball. So who knows? Maybe the offensive line stays strong, improves, and Hort, Horton, Jordan Howard and Matt Breida actually do create a running game for them that was non-existent last year. So Right off, the, right off the bat for opportunities, Devontae Parker may not be able to get that, those targets right. like he did last year because Preston Williams was great before he got hurt. Um, I guess they don't really have anybody else, though. Alan Hearns, Albert Wilson. Um, yeah. So, and another thing know. is Devontae Parker's ascension happened in the second half once Preston Williams got injured. Mike Isecki got a bump in targets. So, yeah. that it was Preston Williams and Devontae Parker that were getting all the targets prior to Preston going down. Then that be, that Preston Williams became Mike Gusecki and Devontae Parker. Shifted over, yeah. Right. So I think it, with another pass-catching option, I think it's going to be less for Devontae Adams. To, or Devontae Parker. Adams. Devontae Parker <laughs> to feast on. Did I say Devontae Adams earlier too? I feel like I did. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, but anyways – so I don't think we can be really optimistic that Devontae Parker is going to be sus- able to sustain what he did in the second half where he quite honestly just went bonkers. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like if dominant wide receiver. Right. From week, week eight on, his targets were 6, 10, 10, 11, 10, 2, 7, 15, 11. So I want all of that on my team, but he's absolutely. Not do that. Yeah. I don't think it's going. I think it's just going to take a hit in everywhere, just a little bit, but it'll be enough to bring him down. And you're not going to want to draft him because people are going to draft people draft based on what they last saw because that's all you really have. You, everything else is speculation. So I think that where you're going to have to draft him in the sixth round is, although it's not outrageous I think that you can get better players. They have AJ Green in that same area, Marquise Brown. Jarvis Landry. So the options around him are those kind of like wishy-washy yeah. receivers. And then you take your – I'd much rather go around later where they have Brandon Cooks here, at, uh, supposedly at the seventh round. So, I would do, actually, I think. It's, it comes down to, your, I guess, your risk tolerance and what you believe. I mean, <laughs> yeah. We're all proven wrong at some point during the season about someone. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm willing to – <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> Zing. Uh, but yeah, so that was my take on Devonta Parker. I'm not too bullish on him coming up in the 2020 season, at least not to the same extent other people are. Checks out. Oh, yeah, I'm not that high on him as well. But I guess that is our – that was three. Right? That, <laughs> that was our top three, or I guess top six for both of us combined – Regression candidates for the 2020 season. Make sure to go ahead and join us next time. Um, yeah, we'll have something 
even better than this, even though this was so riveting. We'll have something, we'll have a topic even better than this next episode. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys later. All right, take care. Thanks. Bye.